Hi, my name is uh, Damien Garros. I'm a managing director with Network to Code. And these sessions will be about exploring you know, the GraphQL, the new GraphQL integration for uh, Notabot. So what is GraphQL? Uh, I imagine some of you already are very familiar with it. And, and sorry, before jumping into it, let's put that into the bigger picture of uh, how does that fit into the different use case. And so for this one, we're really diving into, uh, you know, Notabot as an extensible data platform and how we will be able John has been talking about how we put all this data into um, into Notabot, how we model the network, how we are able to define all of that, tailor that to our specific uh, business need. Now the question is, how are we going to consume that uh, from the outside? And it's a it's a very important um, a piece of how that works into a, an automation framework. So what is GraphQL? And and I will imagine that a lot of you knows about it. Some uh, probably haven't heard of it. GraphQL, the idea is it's a language that lets you query relational data. It's actually uh, an industry standard. It's been around for, for many years. Uh, really uh, very popular specifically to build web applications. And um, and so we're bringing that into uh, another bot because we think it really solves uh, a very important problem, which is about uh, consuming the data uh, when we are outside of uh, of Notabot. And so let's look at exactly what is the current situation, what are the challenges, and hopefully that will give you um, a good understanding of what we're trying to solve. So John presented earlier, at the heart of Notabot, there is a schema. It's all about the relationship of the data. It's all about all this information. You talk a lot about you know, the ability now that you have to capture those relationship. And if you want to consume from outside, today you have those REST API. And you know, for a lot of us, we're, we're discovering when to touch automations, we discover REST API, REST APIs are amazing. They let you do so much you know, without touching the UI. But by definition, REST APIs, they are very you know, uh, single dimensional. They are actually mapped. Each There's a lot of endpoints. And usually, it's they let you do one type of operations on one type of device. For example, you have an API for a site. And you can create a new site, update a site, download 1,000 sites but you will touch only one type of object, the site with that. And then you have an endpoint for device, you have an endpoint for interface, you have an endpoint for prefix, and then you have all of them. So in, you know, in all about there's almost, I'll say feature parity between what you can do in the UI and what you can do in the API. Now the challenge comes when you really want to consume this data from the outside. Let's say you actually have your uh, automation frameworks, whether you're using Ansible, Narnier, or, or any system for that matter. Now you actually need to pull these informations outside. And let's say that you will actually use Ansible to generate the configuration. So to build the full configurations and actually you know, uh, use um, uh, the previous use case that was defined, like if, if you build this new site, now you want to build the full configuration for a device, you will need to pull all of those endpoints and you'll have need to get the information about the site, the interface, the prefix. We're probably talking, you know, 20, even 50 query to the API just to get the information from one device. And then there's actually a lot of logic that needs to happen on the side uh, to actually reconstruct all this data, uh, data and put the interface with the IP, with the device and all of that. So it's, it's kind of, we have this amazing relational system that is storing everything, but when we're outside, we're losing that. And that's really where GraphQL completely changed the, the game is that, GraphQL has a single endpoint, and it was a single query. We can actually query multiple objects, and we can traverse the relationship in the database any way we want. And there's actually no entry points. Like, for example, here, I'm going into from the device, and then I'm, I'm collecting interfaces and VLAN and prefixes and IP associated with this device. But I could as well you know, start from a site and explore the list of devices and interface. And, and it's really this, this query language that doesn't uh, a limit on what you can query uh, from the outside. And for us, that completely changed the game. Actually, we've been you know, building custom APIs for customer for some time because we really see like the, the reconstructions and consumption of those data as a, as a big challenge today. So that's where uh, GraphQL, uh, GraphQL uh, uh, help. Now, GraphQL is itself, again, a, a standard industry. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of library. Where the challenge comes with, um, with Notabot is we have these very dynamic data models. We want to let people create their own custom relationship, their own plugin, their own system. So we have this um, you know, extensive flexibility. And now we also wanted to bring that uh, as part of GraphQL. So let's go for a demo. And hopefully, you know, if you never heard of it, that will, uh, that will really help. So now if you actually go in the, in the menu I, you see at the bottom, if you were already using the API, now you'll see there's a, a new um, 
a new link next to it for GraphQL. So GraphQL, there's actually multiple ways to consume it. You can uh, consume it from the UI here, and we'll see it's a very uh, user-friendly, and you can also run that through the, uh, the API. But uh, what's interesting with GraphQL first is let's explore the schema. GraphQL is completely schema-driven. So if we look here, we have the complete schema of the source of truth that is uh, available inside um, inside Notobot that is available. So you can see here for a site, I will have a lot of information. So I'll have the contact information. So I can, I know that as part of a site, I have devices, I have you no know, racks. And so all of those information are here and now I can query that. So if I want to start, for example, and what's interesting here, if you see as I, as I type, he actually show me if my query is valid, he propose me options because, because the system is, is again uh, defined by a schema, the UI know exactly what is the valid query and what is not. So here I will you know, start with a very simple query where I say, I want to collect the device that are part of a site of name AMS for Amsterdam, and then I just want the name. And that's a very simple query. If I run that, the system returned me the name of all of the device that are part of this site. So the first thing we're seeing here is GraphQL has a completely different paradigm than, than the REST API is like, you define what you want to get. So by definition, it's actually much faster because in a lot of cases, I just need the name of the device, or maybe I need the name of the device and its role. And that's all I really care about on this case. I don't need to have the additional information. So here I'm able to say, okay, I want the name and for this device, because the schema knows there's a role attached to it, then I want the role. And now I have those information. And we can go on and, and have you know fairly advanced query now. For example, let's say that in this case, I actually want to get the interface of this device. For each interface, I will drive the name. There's all the other inputs. I have the MTU and I have the descriptions, but I don't really care about it right now. I just want the name. Um, I also want in those specific interface, for example, I have a custom field that is defined. So I also can get the role of the custom field. And then I know that I have potentially IP address attached to this interface. So I want to collect that as well. So here I already have a pretty good baseline if I actually wanted to generate the configuration for my device. And now if I run that, now I have all the information that come back in a single query and I don't have to reconstruct them. I actually have all of them. Now, some of the use cases, we can even take that further. For example, we can see now, you know, I, I know I have an interface, I have the IP. I actually would like to go further. I would like to have information of what is connected to this interface. So because we have the cabling, we have the ability to keep traversing the relationship and actually connect the name of the device and the name of the interface connected on the other side of the link. If I run that, I will get this query that will tell me, okay, on the other side of this interface for this device, I actually have edge two on this link. And, um, and so I, I, I hope you're seeing the powers and all you can do in terms of you know, what you query and, and what you can define. What, um, uh, what John was saying as well is like the relationship, you can also query that. So in this specific instance of uh, Notobot, I do have some relationship defined. So for example, here I have a relationship between VLAN and device and RAC and, and VLAN. So here, if I say, I wanna go on a specific rack for a site. So here all, right away, it tells me like there's something wrong. Like those inputs are not valid for a rack object. So I will update my query. So if I say, I wanna see all the rack for this specific site, again, I should get all the name of the rack and I'll have the ability and I see that I have my relationship rack to VLAN that is available. And because I already captured that on the other side, what I have is a VLAN that has a VLAN name, has a VLAN ID. And now I can make those query and I'll have the information about what are all the VLANs that are specifically attached to this rack. Let's say that I'm deploying an IP fabric and I know my VLANs have a, a locally significant now I can capture all of that <clears throat> and grab those information again to consume uh, from the outside. So in a nutshell, that's really the power that, that GraphQL provides. Hey, Damien, real quick. So, so what you're showing here on using GraphQL is, so obviously I can hit the API, pull JSON data and parse it and all that. Is, is the power here that you're trying to show a quick view that gives you the same JSON payload from within the UI, 
or is there a down or do you have benefits that um, you haven't got to yet? I guess is where I'm getting. No, again, it's and, and maybe it's a, it's a problem that you only understand when you or by, by practicing it. And I, I imagine you have experience with that. But the, the issue is right now, if I want to build a configuration for this device, I will have a Jinja template yeah. and I will need to pass all the information to the Jinja template. And to be able to have those information Ansible, I will need to make dozens, hundreds of, of queries. Right. And then I will need to process the data. And I will need to put it back together to be able to actually give it to my template. So it's just an example. But there's always like there's there's today, because of the way REST API is done, there's a lot of logic that we need to implement yeah. on the client side to consume the data properly. With GraphQL, we kind of turn the system around and we say, okay, the data is relation is relational by definition. So let's the client client uh, express exactly what they want to get, and then we'll keep the relationship and all this information as we send back the query. So uh, it really can give you more than what a single view in the API can can give yeah. you. It, so I guess the the point is is exactly what you were saying is I don't have to write the code to talk to the API and do all that parsing and all that. It's an easy way for somebody to just get the data they're really caring about and not Absolutely. to write all that. Okay, Absolutely. I, I, I'm going to interject here. Um, so I've used dynamic inventories with Ansible before, where with just a hundred or so devices, it would take seven minutes for the dynamic inventory script to run against the REST API. With this, it should run significantly faster because you're not making multiple calls and most of the dynamic inventory scripts are not using requests, um, uh, HTTP, um, uh, multi, uh, the pipelining, I forget the name of it off the top of my head. Um, so they're making individual HTTP calls. And if they're running with SSL as well, then you're doing TLS setups every single time, which adds to the time more. So this would significantly speed up the dynamic inventory and put less strain on the system. Yeah, that's, um, you're right. There's also the fact that probably today, and I guess my personal opinion, I know there's a lot of people doing that. I personally would not recommend to pull all the interface when you build in dynamic inventory. I think personally, it's a bad practice because most of the time you don't need all of those information. You're just heading out for nothing. And people are doing that because there's this need to process the data to get it into the right place. And it's easier to do that in the dynamic inventory because it's hard to do it later on. But technically, if you think of Ansible or, or Nornier, they're really good at executing tasks in parallel. So instead of pulling all the information from the inventory, what you can do now is just say, okay, first task in my playbook or my run is actually to make one query for each device to get just the information I need for this device. And the end result is actually much uh, faster. And, uh, and you always get a super fast inventory and you have a very just information that you need uh, when you need it, when you actually execute the task. I think the overarching point here is that to lower the barrier of entry for dealing with this data, there's, you know, if you look on, you know, the API, the Swagger spec or Open API spec, there's dozens of APIs. And, you know, I think what you saw with Demi did, it really, it's very, fairly intuitive. Sorry for going down that rabbit hole, Damien. No, no, that's, <clears throat> that's great. I that's thought that's what you were trying to show is the value that, you know, the much easier, a lower entry to, to getting the data. So thank you. Yeah, I have to say, I'm glad you did. And that helped me understand it better. Cause it's not, you know, it's, it's more of like a server side function where it all kind of like gets condensed and you get one result back versus having to, you know, parallelize and, and grab a bunch of different you know, discrete results. So that helped me understand. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, no, thanks Larry. Um, so just to, to close on some of the features, you know, there's something really cool like GraphQL by default actually support variables. So we also have the ability to have variables built in and automatically pass on the side exactly what we want. Uh, so that's, you know, again, some of the things that are built in. Just wanted to really, like the goal is not to replace the REST API. The REST API is there, we're committed to have, you know, and actually GraphQL is only today, even if the GraphQL standard supports read and write, and uh, other functions here, we're really focusing on reading because for us, the problem we're trying to solve is to consume those information. And the REST API is actually really, really good to create object, object, update objects and all that. So, um, you know, it's really one additional tool in our toolbox and where, you know, GraphQLs would be really optimized for complex query, would be optimized to touch multiple objects in a single query, cons uh, conserve the relationship. 
The rest still is the solutions to where to go if you want, want to have a really large volume of data. And if you really want to collect thousands of devices, thousands of interface, that's still uh, you know, the, the way to go. So uh, again, just uh, an additional uh, uh, solution on the side. The, um, at some sites, so we think we covered that relationship. Just to give you an idea, so it's, it's a new features, love to get some feedback. Uh, we're planning to add a ton to it. There's you know, more you know, paginations coming in, want to optimize the response time want to optimize also would like to build a library so that everybody doesn't have to learn even so query language. You could actually create your own endpoint that has a query pre-assigned to it. And so, okay, if I hit this specific endpoint in the API, then I will automatically get this fairly complex query. And so that you have a centralized system. Uh, so again, a lot to come and, and love to uh, to hear the, the feedback from the community. Just to give you a, a perspective of the other integration, Again, so we have REST API, GraphQL, and Webhooks to integrate with the system. And we're also releasing a set of Ansible modules, Narnia inventory, and both of them are actually uh, based on, on the Python SDK. So we're releasing PyNodoBot. This is also a, a fork of PyNetbox. Uh, and we, we added you know, additional capabilities, for example, to talk to the uh, GraphQL interface in addition to the uh, REST interface. So we're really trying to uh, reconstruct the whole ecosystem to be able to uh, consume the information that is inside the source of truth uh, from the outside. With that, um, that was all for GraphQL. If there's any questions, I'll be uh, happy to answer. Thank no you. questions, just a, a thank you for coming out with that feature. Seems like it'll definitely improve operation versus doing all that filtering manually via the, the API like in, uh, like in NetBox even maintaining your list of queries of, for what you want is just you know, infinitely simplified. That's amazing stuff. <laughs>